The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Well, Skip, we're about ready to go. Hi, I'm Dave DeWitt, your host for Heat Up Your Life. We're about ready to take off on a whirlwind tour of the chili pepper cuisines of the Western Hemisphere. We're going to Jamaica, Mexico, Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and then back here to New Mexico. So hang on to your taste buds and join us for Hot Plates, the final episode of Heat Up Your Life. Oh. interest of people, peppers, and passion, we dedicate this next hour to Heat Up Your Life. Episode 3, Hot Plates, Spicy Foods from Around the World. After a thorough inspection of our 1937 British Tiger Moth, my pilot Skip assured me that we were ready for takeoff. Clear prop. Clear prop. Make it hot. It's hot. Contact. Contact. Hand pulled prop. I was really in for an adventure this time. Our first destination, Jamaica, home of the Scotch Bonnet Chili and famous jerk foods. Once airborne, I asked my trusted aviator for a map to track our trip. Skip assured me that he carried only the very latest in navigation aids, which I could find in my cockpit. I had been to that beautiful island before, but had never traveled in such grand style as today. After landing at Montego Bay, I was to meet driver and chili expert David Brown for a drive through the Jamaican Highlands. We finally arrived at the historic Good Hope Great House, where I met with Winston Stona, director of the Bush of Brownie Company. And now Caribbean cuisine and Jamaican cuisine in particular is, is being discovered all over the world. Yes. <laughs> Especially in the United States. Discovered and <laughs> encountered. <laughs> it's a second encounter. That's right. It's, it's a second encounter. Right. But you know, it's an interesting thing that I'm finding. I just returned from the States, and it's a very heartening thing. I now see a lot of major American companies producing products that are being either Caribbean in flavor or, in some instances, being called Caribbean. And I think that it serves to legitimize the cuisine. You know, I know some people are worried and say, oh, but will you be able to sell it? But I think it serves to legitimize the cuisine. I think it removes it from being a fad in the mainstream, you know, I mean, I, and it, it's fascinating to me. It was fascinating to me, too. And Winston suggested that for some authentic Jamaican food, we should find some jerk, real Jamaican barbecue, that is. And that was easy to do. The Double V Jerk Center came highly recommended. And since it was such a short distance from our lodgings at the Siboney Resort in Ocho Rios, we decided to drop in for lunch. Hi, we're here at the Double V Jerk Craig, Center Jonathan, in Ocho Rios, and we're okay. talking to Craig. Okay. And what's your last name, Craig? Bigelow. Okay, Craig Bigelow. And uh, Craig, I understand you're from Boston Beach, is yes, that right? Yes, we're from Boston, yeah. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how Jerk got started in Boston Beach. Okay, that's started from our four parents, that's our grandfather, our greater grand, you know? Uh -huh. They are the ones who started the jerk, you know? Uh -huh. From there we take on. My I see. daddy, from my daddy, from his daddy to his daddy, me, I'm straight up, you know? And so, didn't you tell me you've been cooking jerk since you were like nine yeah, years old? Yeah, when I was nine years old, I've been here working, man, cooking all the long. <laughs> that's yeah. a long time, so I guess you're the uh, expert and you have all the secrets of okay, uh, yes, jerk, right? Okay, no problem. Okay, well tell me, could you, can you share one little secret? about jerk? Okay, that's the seasoning. The, the seasoning. seasoning? The seasoning. It's all in the seasoning. Okay. Seasoning. And in, in the seasoning, uh, you use uh, pimento, right? Yeah, that's 21 different spices they use in the season. Oh, I see. Yes, 21 different spices. You use scotch bonnets too, yes. right? We, we use scotch bonnet, but it doesn't have to be scotch bonnet. 
Oh. You can use a pad of pepper. You know, bird pepper, that's a finer type. Right. Scotch bonnet, but it's scotch bonnet, very, very hot. Okay, do you use country peppers too? Yeah, and country peppers. Okay. Yeah. And, um... Pimento. Okay, 20, 21 different spices, spices uh, in the seasoning. Okay. And then, um, where do you get your meat? Where do you get the pork? Okay, we get it from our local farmers. Oh, I see. Yeah, from local farmers. I see. Do you go buy from them or have contracts with them? for? Because you go through a lot of meat yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. We, we go to them. And or they take it out here. They take it here, you know? Okay. Yes, and we just do it around the back there. On the tables. We cut it up and season it around the table. We buy them all. We buy them all. Whole pig. Right. Yeah, just take out the inside and get them scraped. Uh -huh. them here. We do the whole, everything around the back. I see. Okay, well, well, tell me a little bit about uh, about this fire here and the fire that we have in back of us here. Okay. What, what, are you, what are you doing over here? This is the pit. Okay. That's where we keep the coal, the charcoal. Right. The hood there is to keep the fire, to keep it lively, to keep it burning. Right. We're going to burn the coal there. Uh-huh. We take it with a shovel. Oh, give me the shovel. He's going to show us how to do it here. Yeah. We use the shovel like this. Now notice the shovel has a wooden handle so yeah, it doesn't yeah. get too hot. <laughs> okay, I break it here, the shovel here. Uh-huh. Take it up from here and we throw it under. I see. Okay. Right. We throw it under there. The heat. The heat from, from the coal, that's what cooked this coal. Okay. Yeah. Now, and then you put the uh, the meat on there and then you put the, uh, this meat has been already seasoned and, yeah. and marinated for a long yeah, time? Yeah, seasoned <laughs> overnight, like a night before. Seasoned. I see. Like this evening for tomorrow. Okay. okay. And, and then... Yeah. And then you put this uh, metal over the top of yeah, it. Yeah, I put a zinc there to keep the heat down. Keep the heat, heat down okay. To get the top bacon. I see. Now, if you put the wood under there, it would get too much yeah, flame, yeah, right? Yeah, you can't put the wood under there. It's burned. It does turn color. Get very brown. I see. And it's not cooked. Can I take a little taste of that? Okay, no problem. Boy, I see my thumb. Okay, he's gonna. Well, never gonna mind. Come. Please. Okay. Oh, great. This is the food. Okay. Oh, yeah. Very hot. Yeah. Right. Spicy? That's the best jerk I've had so far oh, okay. on this Thank trip. You. Yeah. Number one. Number one. By now, I was ready to cool down by the sea. And what better place than Norma's at the Wharf House, where Chef Norma Shirley showed us another aspect of Jamaican cooking. Okay, I'm going to be showing you how to do a curried lobster that we do in the island. We melt some butter, say about two tablespoons of butter, make sure that the butter doesn't burn. And to this we're going to add, and I can, I'm going to use my hands, because I think hands are here to be used. We're going to put some scallions, a generous amount of scallions. We're going to put some garlic, which I have creamed with a little olive oil, or you can just use any vegetable oil and mix that in. And also, we're going to put some curry powder. Let's put about a teaspoon and a half, and we have the Madras curry powder. Tell me about the Madras curry powder. Well, it's from, it's, it's from India. It comes from, from Madras in India, and it's quite a much more spicy. If you could smell this, you could smell the flavor that's coming off from it. It's great. And you, we're going to put this on and just sort of saute it for a couple of seconds, really. Then to this now, we're going to add the, what we know as the Scotch bonnet pepper, which I'll show you one of them in its real form, this. And this is a chopped up. Now, we're just going to put a little bit of the scotch bonnet pepper in. It's been cut. Try not to use the seeds, as what happened with the seeds is that the seeds give a much more hotter flavor. And really, you want some heat, but what you want, you don't want that such heat that you, for heaven's sake, you're, you're just burning your tongue and you've, you're not really enjoying your meal. And I'm going to add couple of shells of fresh thyme. This is, to me, this is the queen of spice. This is wonderful. And I'm just going to take some of the leaves off. We added a little bit of water or chicken stock, if, if you rather that, to give it a little bit more liquid in it. 
And to this now, we're going to blend this. We're going to blend it. I'm just going to put it in a blender and blend it till it's smooth. Consistency is coating the back of your spoon, see? See? I created it myself. Because I find that what happens is lobster become too rubbery. So I make the sauce and then put the lobster in. People tend to be cooking the lobster as they're making the sauce. So the lobster gets overcooked and becomes terribly rubbery. And what you want to do is to have the lobster still quite succulent, you know, um, maybe even to the point of being underdone. Because as you know, that shell food really gets rubbery if they're overcooked. Well, most anything. Now here we have some lobster. And what I've done is taken it out of the shell and just cut them in sort of nugget-sized pieces. We're just going to drop this in, bits of lobster. This is enough for two people. And then we're just going to gently, just going to turn the lobster, literally just turning the lobster over in, in this sort of marinade or sauce, whatever you want to call it. We're going to just let it cook. Here is the elegant finished dish, curried Jamaican lobster with Otaheite apples. I just came in out of the rainstorm. It's pouring out there, but uh, you've been cooking here, I see. Yes, we have some wonderful lobster. Oh, I'm great. sorry about the rain. Oh, no, the rain's wonderful. It makes the would beautiful like Jamaican... Taste? Oh, yes, I sure would. Oh, I love curry. I love lobster. And I is love your curry. No, it's perfect. Good. And what kind of apple is this? Oh, Tahiti. Otaiti. Comes from Tahiti. I'm oh. not quite sure if Columbus brought it over. I know it's not Captain Bly. Uh -huh. He brought the breadfruit over. Right. And the ackee, too. And the ackee, yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you. In a few hours, the storm cleared. And as my faithful pilot Skip and I taxied out of Montego Bay, it was evident to me that Jamaica had established its reputation as a haven for fiery foods. But while we skimmed over the Caribbean Sea, I wondered how much this spicy island cuisine had influenced the United States. Our flight took us over the island of Cuba and back to the States. Soon we landed at the busy Miami International Airport. I knew that Miami food was Cuban-oriented and supposedly not too spicy, but I had a hunch about this trip. And the hunch paid off. In Little Havana in Miami, I met with Florida food expert Stephen Raiklin, author of Miami Spice and the Barbecue Bible. I was curious about the invasion of hot and spicy Caribbean foods into the southern United States. Uh, tell me about the influence of the Caribbean on the food of Miami, especially in terms of hot and spicy. Well, the influence is enormous, and if you think about geography, Miami juts like a thumb into the Caribbean Sea. So, uh, and we are the focal point, really, for all of those islands. In other words, when business gets done, it gets done through Miami as much as Inter Island. Now, in terms of the uh, influence of hot and spicy foods, well, uh, Jamaican, very strong, Scotch bonnet chili, the popularity of jerk. And, you know, jerk today has really, it's sort of become like the Caesar salad or tiramisu of, uh, <laughs> of the new millennium. And I'm firmly convinced that jerk uh, was first introduced to the United States through Miami, with little jerk parlors around Miami. And then it spread throughout the rest of the United States. What ethnic groups are here in Miami today that like their food particularly spicy? Well, you know, one that jumps out to mind is uh, the Haitian, and we have the largest Haitian community in the United States. And uh, Haitians have a chili they call the Dom John, the, the, uh, the, the Lady Jean. And it's a bright red uh, pot. It's a member of the Scotch Bonnet family. Uh, and it's used for a couple of different dishes. Uh, one, they make a dish called griot, which are fried spiced pork bits. And the, uh, the pork is seasoned with this hot chili. And uh, all Haitian dishes would be served with something called picles, pickles, which, uh, which is shredded, shredded cabbage, uh, there might be carrot, and the firepower here are these Dom John chilies, and they're used with great profligacy, and this stuff is really hot. Well, Steve, let's go check out the peppers in this market here. You bet. Okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. Now, these are, I know these 
Philippines is rogatillos. We call them cachuchas. Chile's cachuchas here. Cachuchas I mean, means cap or yeah. cat or yeah, something. Well, like you know, like a bonnet. A bonnet, yes. Right. Okay. Like a bonnet. And these are used a lot in Cuban and, uh, and uh, Puerto Rican cooking. Now, what's interesting about these, these, uh, these are cousins of the Scotch bonnet, the uh, world's hottest chili. And if you break them open and smell, that sure smells the like aroma, a Scotch bonnet. Right. But I'm going to do something you would never do with a Scotch bonnet. Pop it in your mouth, mouth and eat it. And eat it. Yeah. Right. This you wouldn't the, do that with these, for no. example. This is the, uh, the, uh, the cachuchas here. These have the aroma and flavor, that floral kind of apricotty flavor of the Scotch bonnet, but none of the heat. Right. So uh, very little of the heat, I would say. I mean, there's a little bit of heat there. Yeah. Yeah. How would they cook with these? Yeah. Yeah. What they would normally do is they tear out the seeds, they discard the seeds, and then the chili would be chopped up and added into a mixture called a sofrito. Right. That is pan-fried onions, garlic, and these cachucha chili. And this would be used to flavor everything from rice to soups to stews. I mean, it is the quintessential flavoring of the Spanish Caribbean. Okay. Okay. Tamales. I mean, uh, I just love these guys. And I don't, they're not well known outside of uh, Miami, but in Miami you can find them at supermarkets, you can find them everywhere. There's a little bit of a bite. A little bit of heat. Yeah. A little bit of heat, right? <laughs> well, luckily we're at the Palacio de los Jugos, the Juice Palace. Right. So after this, we can uh, cool our palates off with a, uh, a glass of fresh tropical fruit juice. Good idea. Stephen suggested that the best way for us to taste the spicier Nouveau Cuban food would be to visit the trendy South Beach part of Miami Beach. And I had no problem with that. It's always fun to go to the beach. And in South Beach, the people watching is all part of the fun. Stephen recommended that we visit Yucca Restaurant. In case you don't know, Yucca is a starchy tuber. But some people have suggested, tongue in cheek, that Y-U-C-A stands for Young Urban Cuban American. In the kitchen of Yucca, the chef quickly proved that chilies are catching on in the new Cuban cuisine. He was preparing El Mariachi, which is New York steak served with sauteed chilies, vegetables, and a yucca puree. First, he slices and chops jalapenos and scotch bonnet chilies and sautés them quickly with other vegetables. Now, I'm not going to show you something as simple as grilling a steak, but after the steak is grilled, it is sliced and placed on a plate with a yucca puree, which looks like mashed potatoes but tastes much better. Then the vegetables are placed on the plate. And to prove that chilies are more popular than ever, crushed hot red chili is sprinkled over the steak and a finishing sauce is applied. Then comes the most important part of the lesson, where I get to eat the entire meal. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Having sampled the best of Miami Spice, we set sail for our next hot spot, New Orleans. We'd meet up with Pilot Skip later on in Texas. To get a quick lesson on hot and spicy Louisiana food, I cruised into the French Quarter Festival, where I found that people down there just love crawfish. They like it simple, as in crawfish boil. but they also like it fancied up a little, as in crawfish etouffee. I'm cooking up uh, crawfish etouffee. My favorite. That crawfish so is very, very, very delicious. And shrimp and crawfish crepe. In multicultural New Orleans, I found a Chinese spin on hot and spicy Louisiana called crawfish in oyster sauce. This is uh, all this, the hot spicy. Hey, we cook our own peppers. We ground them up, we cook it in some bean sauce for about two hours, and just releases all the flavor. We release it here. Do you have smell the vision on there? Yeah, all right, get ready. This is Charlotte. We got some Charlotte and some onion. We got that in there, some black bean sauce with garlic. We got some onion and some minced meat in there. Now I'm gonna soft stir fry a little bit. This is a combined effort, you know, we're five brothers. This is my oldest brother, this is number one son, this is my four son. We all work together. 
Other French Quarter favorites were big pots of gumbo, blackened chicken, and hot sauce everywhere. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> I like them hot. I like them hot. I like them hot. Right. And a vendor explains how to use his hot pepper jelly. You can use this with Philadelphia cream cheese, spread it on celery stalks, use it to make your barbecue sauce, chicken wing dip, chicken liver. You can even put it on top of ice cream, believe it or not. It's good. As much as I hated to leave New Orleans, I had an appointment in Lafayette. At the beautifully restored Acadian village near Lafayette, I met up with Chef Scott Landry, who hails from Lake Charles. He agreed to cook some of his favorite native dishes outside, just to show how easy it is. He made crawfish etouffee, chicken and sausage jambalaya, and one of his favorite foods from a nearby bayou. What we're gonna do right now is we're going to season this alligator up that we caught, and we're gonna put that bar and seasoning on there. So oh, remember, you got to season that, and it doesn't have to be long you season that, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's all. And then my friend, I got this friend from Brobridge, he makes this stuff from the farmyard, and it's some habaneros and some cayenne peppers, and it's. It's a little bit of everything. It's a brand new bottle, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna try, no, I didn't have to use my teeth. You know, God give you some can opener, you just open your mouth like that. But anyway, I'm gonna put that in there. Oh, you can't put that in there like that. You gotta put that in there like this. Put you a lot. Mmm, boy, that smells good. And then I'm gonna sprinkle this all around in there, and I'm gonna use my knife to move that around. Oh, that's gonna be hot for you people up north, but not too hot for down here. Then I'm gonna put some parsley and some onions. And then I'm gonna use these red bell peppers and these yellow bell peppers, cause you know the difference is? One's more ripe than the other one. And they're gonna go bad if I don't use that. So I'm gonna use that right now. And then alligator, the most important thing to remember about alligator is to cut all that fat off. Cause that fat, oh man, that's nasty. But you know, if you gave it to some perfume people, they could render that fat and make some skin so soft or something. I'm not so sure what that is. But. I'm gonna tell you, if you don't have no alligator at your grocery store, I don't think you might get that, but in Lake Charles, we got that. If you don't, use some chicken. And what I wanna tell you about this dish is, alligator, if you cook it too long, oh, it's like that rubber on your, on your feet. But uh, you don't have to do that if you want. My wife, you know, I used to have a wife, but she left me one time. She's the best housekeeper I ever met. I married her, when I left, she kept the house. It's one of those things, you just can't understand that. And you know, alligator, everybody wants to know what that tastes like. <laughs> I told some men the other day when I was in Florida, it tastes a little bit like manatee or eagle or any of that stuff. But don't cook that, oh, they'll get on your case. But it makes a pretty good gumbo. And you stir that all up and you got the colors in there. If you want you put your hand in there and tear it before it gets too hot. And if it's too hot for you, that sauce that I'm cooking with is pretty hot, yeah. You just add a little water. Well, I got Stan Goche's stuff over here. I'm gonna put that out of the way because that's not important, the sauce. It's important that I cooked it. That's what it is. But my friend Stan, he can cook. You, you don't know. 
When we went to that fiery food show, they gave us all them peppers, man. We made some gumbo. Ha! Huh, it was so fun. And the good thing about Louisiana cooking, you got to remember, is that anything can do that. If you got some onions and some celery and some bell peppers, you can do that dish just like that. It don't, it's not bad. And as you can see, it don't take long to cook this. You don't want to overcook it because it'll be too chewy, okay? And you don't want no fat because it's going to be rancid. And I'm, I got this dish all done here. If them onions cut down a little bit, it would be fine. You want a little smoke? I can make some smoke. Whoa! See that smoke? I can make it smoke. I got my knife here. That's so you can taste that. Mmm, mmm. That's what that Vernon Roger does. Mmm, mmm. Or like my friend Justin says, man, I guarantee that's good. And that's that. I'm finished. You get a picture of that for your cameras. Okay? I'm going to eat that with a little rice and gravy in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Get some of this alligator now. Do alligators eat crawfish? They eat anything that don't eat them first. Oh, okay. Which is anything. <laughs> hmm. That's good. Well, thank it's you. Spicy. Mm-hmm. Like That'll that. make you grow up big and strong. Alligator. Hard to find in New Mexico, but I guess it's good here. Oh, yeah. Well, you can make it with anything you want. Now I headed for the Lone Star State, the home of Tex-Mex and more. It is said that Texans put jalapenos in everything. To prove that is true, I tasted an outrageous dessert at the Demonstration Kitchen at Central Market in Austin. We're going to be making a jalapeno white chocolate begonia flour ice cream. That is Jeff Blank, one of two executive chefs at one of Austin's finest restaurants, Hudson's on the Bend, along with Jay Moore. They already have a half gallon of milk and a quart of heavy cream and a rolling boil, and Jay is adding eight cups of sugar that will dissolve until the mixture is smooth. Folks, this is not a health food dessert. I'm wait for this to come in, into solution. The next step is to core and dice the jalapenos, and Jeff uses a vegetable peeler to remove the seeds and the hot veins of the jalapeno, which reduces the heat. They will have one cup of diced jalapenos. Our vanilla to that. For flavoring, vanilla is added to the egg yolks, and that mixture is added to the boiling milk and cream. The trickiest part is yet to come. Jeff explains. The secret of cream anglaise is, is to slowly titrate the milk, cream, and sugar, sugar solution into the egg yolks and vanilla, so you gradually br bring that temperature up without causing the eggs to scramble or, or, or to lump. So we're gonna gradually add the hot solution to the cold egg yolk and vanilla solution. Then the process is reversed and the now warm mixture is added to the remaining hot milk. It's strained to remove any lumps and then the mixture is placed in the refrigerator for a few hours. Now the cream anglaise has chilled and Jay's gonna start to make the actual ice cream now. The white chocolate is melted in a double boiler. Then the creme anglaise mixture is added to the chocolate along with the jalapenos, lime juice, and finally, the begonia flowers. Begonia flowers. Then the mixture is added to the metal chilling cylinder. Okay, we've got the paddles in there, the top on, and we'll just slide it right into the barrel, add our ice and rock salt, and begin freezing. While the ice cream sets up, Jeff and Jay make a strawberry mint salsa to top off the dish, as if it needed it. And there's the jalapeno white chocolate begonia ice cream, a little strawberry salsa on top, give it that little southwestern flair, and then a little garnish of fresh begonia flowers. And dessert is served. And Texas jalapenos never tasted so good.
By this time, Pilot Skip and I were ready to leave the Lone Star State and head our trusty tiger moth south of the border in search of the origins of Texas heat. One thing about Mexico, you find chili peppers in the food wherever you go. Pulling out my trusty Mexico map, I quickly identified three great hotspots that we would have to explore. There's the bustling capital, Mexico City. The tropical city of Cancun in the land of the Maya. But for our first stop, we landed in the exotic high desert plains of Oaxaca in search of that land's seven delicious mole dishes. After a quick tour of the craft shops and the chili-filled mercados, we headed out into the country to find mole expert Susanna Trilling at her cooking school. Hi, Dave. Welcome to Oaxaca. Thank you, Susanna. We're here at the Seasons of My Heart Cooking School in Oaxaca with Susanna Trilling. And Susanna, what are you going to make for us today? Today we're going to make mole negro oaxaqueño, and we're going to make two types of tamales, one with chipiles, which is a wild herb, and one with strips of chili de agua, which is a native chili to Oaxaca that's fresh. Okay. Why don't you tell our viewers exactly what a mole is? Well, mole comes from the word, uh, an Aztec word, which means mixture or concoction. And it's used with different chilies, mixed with different nuts and seeds and spices, and all mixed together in one pot. And then you cook your meat and chicken on the side, and then it's later mixed into the sauce itself. Sounds wonderful. I'm going to get out of your way and let you cook moles and tamales. Great. Thanks, Dave. Susanna is fortunate that she has the help of her assistants, Paula Martinez, and her daughter, Francisca Marcus Martinez, in preparing this elaborate concoction. Paula is now grinding up the almonds, uh, the peanuts, and the sesame seed paste, the end of the sesame seed paste, for the mole negro. And this is the traditional way that it's done here in Oaxaca. Many women still do it this way because they feel that the blender just doesn't have the right consistency, and they say that everything tastes more sabrosa, más sabrosa, when it's made on the metate. They grind the chilies this way, they grind the tomatoes, the milled tomates or the tomatillos, and they also do all the nuts. Paula's also going to do the blackened seeds that we've charred from all the inside of the chilies as well. The next step is to add fresh thyme and Mexican oregano to the mixture of toasted nuts and sesame seeds. She's mixing together to make one final paste, and we'll add that to the chilies that are blended and be fried, and the tomatoes and milled tomates, and we're going to add all the other ingredients, and then we add this mixture as well. Susanna describes the unique chili peppers used in the mole negro. We're going to use chihuacle negro, which is a chili that's especially from Oaxaca, pasilla mexicana, which is a chili from the Zacatex, Mexico, then mulatto, negro or an ancho negro, chili huajillo, and also the chipotle meco, which is a type of seedless chipotle. The next step is to roast garlic and onions on a comal or griddle and then set them aside to cool. Now the next thing we're going to grill, we're going to grill the chilies. And we want to make sure that these huajillos that are the most red of all our chilies today, that they really get toasted black. Because if they're not black, it won't give the mole negro its true color. Spices such as cloves, black pepper, and cinnamon are also toasted. One important step in mole negro is to blacken the seeds of the chilies being used in a deep frying pan. At the same time, Susanna fries the tomatoes and tomatillos together in a little lard or oil. By the time the seeds are blackened, the tomatoes and tomatillos are done. Even more ingredients are fried up for the mole negro, including raisins, pan de muerto, or egg bread, and plantains. Combining modern and ancient technologies, while Susanna is using a blender in the kitchen to puree the chilies and the tomato tomatillo mixture, outside, Paula is grinding up the blackened chili seeds. The next step is to combine all the previously prepared ingredients into a mole sauce. In a cazuela or a clay pot, we have some hot lard here ready to go. It's smoking hot, and that's how you want it. We're going to put the puree of all the dry chilies that are mixed together into the pot and fry them. Susanna adds the pureed tomatoes and tomatillos, the grilled onion and garlic mixture, the nut mixture that Paula prepared on the batate, the bread, plantains, and raisins mixed with the toasted cloves, black pepper, and cinnamon, the blackened chili seeds, 
and even more interesting ingredients such as flame toasted avocado leaves and some semi-sweet chocolate ground from the beans in the Molinas or mills in the markets of Oaxaca. The thing about mole is you have your, your chicken or your turkey or whatever meat you're using cooked on the side and then you return the meat with the stock to the mole and you serve it. But the main feature when you get your plate, you serve it in a bowl and the main feature is the sauce, not the meat. And in, traditionally in Oaxaca, it's not really served with this fork or a spoon, it's really served with a whole pile of tortillas. And your, your t tortillas serve as your spoon. And then you use your fingers to get the meat off the chicken or the, or the turkey. Mm, this looks about ready. Dave, come try some mole. I'd love to. Are I can't wait. Must be starving by now. A lot of steps in this recipe. Yeah. Mmm. Oh, Susanna, this is wonderful. Uh, how else can you serve this mole? Well, we use it to make tamales and mole negro, or also we, we make something called emolados, which is like enchiladas, but with a mole sauce. As you've seen, mole negro demands many ingredients and a lot of preparation, but it sure was worth all the work. My journey into the wonderful world of mole is one that I won't soon forget. After Oaxaca, our next stop was the capital of the country, Mexico City, one of the largest and busiest cities in the world. There we visited the huge La Merced market with its huge selection of chili peppers. We also stopped by the Zocalo, or central plaza of Mexico City. When the Spanish explorer Hernán Cortés arrived here five centuries ago, this was the very heart of the ancient Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. As a matter of fact, the ruins you see behind me were part of that ancient city and were discovered when the subway was built through this very area. Now, chili peppers were extremely important in Aztec daily life and their diet, and no fewer than 20 domesticated varieties of chilies were grown right around this very area. In order to learn how chilies had influenced Mexican cuisine in the centuries since the Spanish conquest, I accepted the invitation of Lula Bertran, a food expert and famous television star. She promised to prepare a number of tasty chili dishes, and I wasn't disappointed. Lula, this is such a beautiful house. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Thank you. I'm oh, glad you're here. look at this. <laughs> well, this isn't just food, Lula. This is like a work of art. Yes, I, I think it is because uh, food is really an art. So um, this well, is um, certainly shows here. Why don't you describe these dishes to us? Uh, starting sure. with this interesting one with the poblano. Hmm. Well, this is really a French technique of a pate, and uh, what I do, I just do a poblano chili pate. Oh, chilies and nogada pate. It is very much like chilies and nogada. And, and this dish with the jalapenos, I guess it's an appetizer. It's an appetizer, and you just uh, do like a, like onion rings, but these are chili rings. Oh, I see. Chorizo. So they're deep fat fried. And then some chorizo on the top? Chorizo on the top, yes. Oh, excellent. Oh, I see. And, mm -hmm. and this abstract painting of a salad, I guess this has a hot and spicy uh, dressing? Is that what Yes, it is? the dressing is really with the chili piquin. And we have a little jicama oh. there and um, the goat cheese, which is... And some is, squash blossoms. And squash blossoms, yes. Let's move down here and uh, talk about this rice dish for a second. The uh, arroz verde, we call it. And this is a green rice, and it, uh, it has also poblano chili mm -hmm. and spinach and cilantro. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And this unusual dish here, describe this for us. <laughs> this is a tamal. Uh -huh. uh, the only thing is that instead of being wrapping in, in banana leaves or in corn leaves, it is uh, wrapped in the chili and oh. in a mold and cooked in a mold. And these are pasillas, correct? It is yes. pasilla. Okay. Course. And down here, I guess this is a, uh, a picadillo stuffing? The picadillo, like yes. Well, this is a um, very Mexican picadillo. And uh, it is a little sweet because the chilies are cooked and caramelized in piloncillo, which is the raw the sugar, that we, sugar yes, right. that we use. And uh, well, we have a, a sauce of avocado and tomatillo. Oh, well, I can't wait to taste all this, but even more than that, I can't wait to uh, watch you cook it. So why don't we go into the uh, kitchen and see what happens? Okay, let's go. Okay. But first, we had to fix an authentic Mexican drink. So Lula, we're gonna make a hot and spicy tequila. What do you call this? Well, I call it tequila enchilado. Tequila enchilado, <laughs> yes. that's nice. Okay, so you're gonna tell me how to do this, right? We have sure. a bottle of tequila here. We have a bottle of tequila. Just use your favorite brand. 
and we start by putting some uh, peppercorns. Okay, about how many? About ten. About ten peppercorns. Yes. There we go. There's about five. There's <laughs> about five more. Okay. Then how about uh, some chile piquin? Okay. That's the hot stuff in there. About the same number? Yes. Okay. Ooh. I dropped one. That's that won't okay. matter. I remember Julia Child used to drop lots of them. Oh, yes. <laughs> just pick them up and put them back in. That's okay, right. what's next? Now, let's put some uh, of the um, lime, lime rim. rim. Okay, yeah. that's good. And uh, if you want to help yourself by putting... Okay, this is different. Okay. There you go. Give me one or oh, two? You're doing it great. Let's just do it with one. One? Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll push that down in there. And then we're going to flavor that with a cilantro lid. Okay. Cilantro uh, spring, right? Right, spring. That's fine. And we push that down in there, down in like there. this, oh, stir it up. You stir it, and then you close it, and you take it to your refrigerator or even to your freezer and keep it there for about a week. About a week. Okay, that looks terrific. Now, you've already done some here for us. It's been, uh, I can see that's been about a week, I guess. Yes, and the flavor is really very, very in, in its best right now. Okay, so how do you prepare so, these um, glasses for, for drinking? To serve it, you just put a little lime around the, around the, edge, the, of the edge of the glass. Okay. Then pass it through the salt, or coat it with salt. Right? Salt. Let's say yes. Mm -hmm. And then with chili piquin. This is a powdered chili. It's a powdered chili. It's going to be oh, real nice. hot, but wonderful for tequila. Okay. So now let me. Even if you have some of the stuff coming out, that's fine. It won't matter. Huh? Okay. okay, I'll take a little taste of this, and then I'm going to go and it? let you cook some more. Great. Perfect. Salud. Thank you. Then Lula showed me how to make her stuffed jalapeno rings, delicioso. To make the batter, she combined one cup of flour, one tablespoon baking powder, one tablespoon salt, and about a half cup of milk. With a whisk, she stirred it until thick. Lula explains the next steps. You slice jalapenos, you take the seeds out, and then you dip them in the batter, and right away in the oil. And you just wait uh, for them to get a very nice brown, light brown. Okay. Still like this. And you just take them out and place them on paper towers. Once you have them fried, crispy, and good, then you're going to stuff them with a mixture of cream cheese and chorizo. You know, chorizo is our Mexican sausage, very spicy, lots of chilies in it. So what we do, what we're going to do is just mix the two of them and have a very nice mixture. And then we're just going to put this on top. And this is a way to serve them, real hot. So um, the chili and the chorizo blend very well. Lula was spoiling me with her great cooking, but alas, I couldn't stay in Mexico City forever. It was time to escape the big city and do like the Mexicans do, go to the beach. So I followed their lead to one of the greatest resorts in the world, Cancun. There at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, I met up with Chef John Gray. Okay, John, so these are very wonderful, exotic dishes, and I'm going to get to taste them all even before you show us how to cook them. So uh, why don't you tell me what I'm going to be trying here? Well, you should probably start with these since uh, this is a little bigger plate. This is a duck that we've done. We've roasted it, and uh, like we described earlier, we just made it with the sauce of chipotle peppers, the tequila, and the honey. Mmm. A little bit spicy, eh? Yeah, that's good. It won't burn anybody out. It's really tasty, though. I like the... I like the flavor of that duck. Yeah, subtle's important when you're working with chilies. You, you don't that's want true. to scare anybody. You don't want to overwhelm the dish, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, Then and we have the, uh, the roasted salmon with the pasilla chilies and smoked tomatoes. Okay, these are little strips of pasillas, I can mm -hmm. tell that. Okay. Mmm, that's really you different. You can maybe try, this is like a potato chip. It's the crispy plantain. You can just oh, yeah. try a piece of that. It's nice and sweet. You guys do things right here at the Ritz, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's wonderful. And this is uh, our traditional tikka and chic. We've uh, served it in like a Mexican clay charola. Uh -huh. and you just make it like a taco. Just take a little bit of this and uh, some of the uh, guacamole if you like and a little tomato and cilantro salsa. Yeah, some pico de gallo. That'll work. A little bit of this. Ah, that's going to be beautiful. You just roll it up. Yeah, just like a taco. There you go. This is a soft taco. Mmm. <laughs> 
Mm. And this is mild again, not not very spicy. A little bit of the the roasted oh, uh, shkatik peppers. Uh, they, I they're a little to put sweet. Some of those on it. Let me get some of those. I completely forgot about those. And this is. A I good can't dish. decide which one I like the best. <laughs> I tell you, it's so uh, wonderful. Well, the tikka and cheek is probably the most messy, fun. Little messy, but wonderful. Ah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Great. Good job. Glad Good you job. Enjoyed everything. Here's how John and I prepared the tikka and cheek. First, John prepared the red acciotti marinade, which is made from a paste consisting of annatto seeds, oregano, and garlic. This is a very simple blender recipe. Adding the acciotti paste, two ounces of lemon juice, orange juice, preferably bitter orange, a little white vinegar, two large cloves of fresh garlic, a half cup of water, and some slices of onion, and a little salt. Once you have all these ingredients into the blender, we're just going to blend this until everything is combined together, and then we're going to marinate the fish in this mixture. This for about three minutes. Here is the beautiful color of the finished marinade. We poured it over the fish to marinate it for several hours, then continued the cooking process outside on the grill along the aqua blue shores of Mexico's Caribbean. Well, we have our, uh, we have our fish ready, Dave. We've taken our marinade uh, that I made before with the achiote. Right, uh huh. And then we simply layered the fish with some of the very thin slices of onion, fresh tomatoes, and the shkatik pepper. Uh huh. What well, we're doing, we're laying this on the banana leaves to protect it from the fire a little bit so that it doesn't actually burn the fish because we just want it almost to kind of steam in the banana leaves. Okay, did you catch this red snapper by yourself? Well, it wasn't me. It was, it was <laughs> one of our friends probably, but it wasn't me. Okay, let me help you with these banana leaves what here because we'll I know we'll you're... Just, we'll take this bottom layer and I'll just lay it on onto the barbecue and then you're going to put all the banana leaves over the top of it. Okay, sounds like a wiener. We just kind of pile them on. We don't just have to. Just pile them uh, on. It's not, yeah, not to be it's neat. kind of a, ste a steamy. We're just going to kind of let it see what it'll do. It'll catch all the heat and it'll work kind of like a pressure cooker, so to speak, keeping all the heat from the bottom up and it'll cook it actually from the top down rather than what you would believe with just the heat coming from the bottom. Almost like a giant tamal. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to leave this for approximately 20 minutes per pound. And, and fish is a little deceiving. This is actually a seven pound fish. So it's, it's one of the larger ones, but if you make smaller pieces, you can, you can just figure it about 20 minutes per pound. Now, do we need to cover this with something else or will the banana no, leaves do it? this will be fine just like this. You'll see after a while, the banana leaves are gonna start to cook a little bit, maybe smoke and add another flavor to the tikka and chic also. This is very uh, popular here in the Yucatan. And, and normally, uh, it, it can be cooked underground, but not everybody can dig a hole in their backyard, so we'll do it in a grill. Just, just but if you have a beach, you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> While staying in Cancun, we took a trip to Tulum, an ancient Mayan coastal city, now partially restored, and very probably one of the places where dishes like tikka chic originated. While we were here at Tulum, we decided to leave an offering of chilies in honor of the Mayas, who also loved chilies and used them in their cuisine many centuries ago. Having honored the Mayan gods, Skip and I were free to return to my home, New Mexico. While traveling from Mexico to the land of enchantment, we flew over the ancient trail of the conquistadors, those intrepid explorers who traveled north more than four centuries ago to settle new lands for the Spanish crown. And with them, they brought Mexican chili pepper seeds to New Mexico. Their successful planting has led to the largest chili pepper crop in what is now the United States. I was more than ready to sample some spicy good cooking. In New Mexico, Santa Fe is not only the political capital, it is also the culinary capital of the state. Because of its popularity with tourists, hundreds of restaurants serve up every cuisine imaginable. As you can imagine, chili peppers play an important role in the dishes served in most of these restaurants. We spoke with Mark Miller, who is a chef, a chili expert, a culinary anthropologist, and the owner of the famous Coyote Cafe. I mean, chili is probably the quintessential American food product. So I think that probably uh, when you 
create an environment in which chili is being used, you have to look at the American traditions that it comes from, and you have to be uh, sensitive and respectful of, the, of those culinary traditions. Chili's, for me, are not just Mexican or Southwestern or Tex-Mex or New Mexican or modern Southwestern. They're one of the most important culinary traditions in America, and that this is one of the products that every single person that eats or cooks in America should know about and know how to use. I'm going to make my goat chili. In Santa Fe, I caught up with Chef Rosa Rykovich and her wonderful poblano chilies. In fact, they were the main focus of what she was going to cook for us. Goat cheese filled poblano relleno on a bed of black bean and sirloin chili. I'm going to dry roast my spices so that I release a little bit of the flavor while I'm sauteing my spices in a dry pan. And this will take about 20 seconds. This will make my dish very aromatic. Mmm, oh, that smells so good, mmm. And now I'm going to saute my onions. In the same pan, I'm putting a little bit of olive oil in. Mmm, oh, this is going to be great. And these are red onions. Ooh. And I'm going to cook these onions for about four to five minutes. I'm going to soften them. Now I've sauteed these onions for four minutes, four or five minutes. Look how golden they are. Mmm, and they smell great. And I'm going to add the garlic. I don't saute the garlic for very long because I don't want to burn it. Mmm. And now I'm going to add my plum tomatoes. I've peeled, seeded, and drained my plum tomatoes. Ooh. Oh, it smells great. And now I'm going to add my jalapenos. Mmm. This will give it some additional flavor. Mm. And now I'm going to add my spices that I've dry roasted ahead of time. Mmm. Oh, they look great. This mixture has to simmer for 20 minutes before I add my soaked black beans. Now while this is cooking, I'm going to brown my sirloin in another pan with a little bit of oil. And this is going to sizzle and smell great. I'm going to brown my meat a little bit at a time. I don't want to fill the pan up too much because if I fill the pan up too much, I'm going to steam the meat and not brown it correctly. Mmm. And now I'm going to show you how to stuff the roasted poblano rellenos. I have here some gorgonzola cheese, I have some chevre goat cheese, and I have a little bit of cream cheese to make the mixture a little bit mellow. And I've mixed the three together, and I have this very nice goat cheese filling. I'm spooning it into my roasted relleno, my roasted poblano chili. And you want to fill them fairly full, and then fold them over. I'm going to dip one in the egg mixture first. Mmm, be sure to twirl it around so that you coat all sides. Shake off the excess, roll it in the blue cornmeal. I like the look of the blue cornmeal and the taste, but you're welcome to use yellow if you wish. Mmm, shake off the extra. And now, mmm, oh, that smells great. I wish you could be here with me. I'm going to make another one, dipping it in the egg. And again in the blue cornmeal. And these will fry approximately two minutes per side. And I'm going to turn them twice. Well, Rosie, you made that look so easy. Well, David, it is really easy. So how do you finish up this uh, dish? Well, I just have to make the chipotle cream. And I have here a little bit of sour cream. I have some goat cheese, some chevre goat cheese. And I have some reconstituted chopped chipotles. I'm going to mix all this together, and I'm going to create a cream consistency by adding a little bit of half and half so that I can squeeze it out of this tube and make designs on my plate. 
and I'm going to serve up some of this chili. Mmm, doesn't this look great? It does, it looks wonderful. Mm. Oh, it smells great too. That has the black beans in it. Yes, it does. It has the black beans, it has the fresh herbs. Sirloin steak? It has sirloin steak, yes. I like to use the best quality of sirloin, but you know, I also have made this dish using chicken. And there goes the stuffed poblano over there. And the chipotle cream. Oh, I'd like to use goat cheese in this dish because it mellows out the heat from the chili. Doesn't that look wonderful? It does look wonderful. Now I get to try it. Yes, help okay. yourself. Mm. <laughs> mm. How is it? Oh, Rosa, it's absolutely <laughs> superb. I love the way the goat cheese sort of tempers the heat of the chili, although this is a hotter poblano than I've had. Really? Yes, it's wonderful. Well, you never can tell how hot poblanos are going to be because their flesh is so thick when you're peeling them. When you peel thinner peppers, you can feel the heat in your fingers, but with poblanos, you can't. We call this poblano roulette poblano because you roulette. don't know how hot it's really going to be. There's so many hot plates and so little time. Ah, well, at least I can leave you with a visual feast for the eyes. More hot plates that I had the pleasure of sampling during Heat Up Your Life. As we have seen during this series, chili peppers conquered the world and then slowly infiltrated their way into American cuisine. They've influenced science, medicine, industry, indeed our very culture, and they're definitely here to stay. I hope you've enjoyed Heat Up Your Life, the ultimate chili documentary. And remember, once you start eating hot and spicy foods, you'll never go back to bland. You'll become an elite citizen of the world of hot and spicy. Bye for now. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.